46 degrees if you were waiting with bated breath to find out. Now, where are we here? Do we have Bob right away at the beginning? Is he here? There was a, a spiritual presence that made itself manifest at the end of Lynn's show. But is he still here now, or am I supposed to... Hey, I don't know what to do. No, I'm here. Oh, he's there. He's there. Oh, he is there. All right. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, it, it sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty good. It sounds as though, I would say, it sounds as though it were the movie, the the, the next voice you hear. Remember with James Whitmore? Oh yes, indeed. Yeah, it's a it's a big sound. It's just uh, to my ears there is that hum, slight hum, and it's uh, there's a little tiny vibrato. But you sound good. It's much better than a phone line. It is, eh? Yeah, it really is. It really well, is. Well, listen, we've got a guy by the name of Kevin Plum who uh, spent a lifetime, an eternity, here today. He worked very hard, and uh, I want him rewarded by a good response from you, Jay. Well, it's terrific. Kevin, okay, you did, you did such a good job. I got a few jobs for you to do over at my place. <laughs> you, know, you know what a turntable costs these days? You can't buy a turntable now, Bob. Everything is CDs. CDs. So I have two turntables that are slowing down a tad. <laughs> sure, Kevin could work that out for me. <laughs> hey, he laughs. He laughs. Hey, what are you laughing about? Eh? Huh? What are you laughing about? Here's uh, a guy who goes home. Well, here's a guy who does four hours on the air, and uh, and he lets you know that he's doing four hours. Then he goes home, and uh, hey, he loves it so much that he comes back. <laughs> He laughs. He laughs. What are you laughing about? <laughs> See, that? See what do happens? I do I really sound like that, Jay? This is just, I'm going to be your conscience. I'm going to do that thing with the conscience. Hello, uh, hello, Robert. Robert, this is your conscience speaking. How many people did you destroy in four hours today, Robert? <laughs> How many people's lives were irretrievably damaged between three and seven because you destroyed them emotionally, Robert? Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad, but you have to make penance, Robert. Your penance, Robert, is that you let Jay Diamond, a rank amateur, uh, take the night off, and since this is working so well, you'll just be here till 2 a.m. taking calls. Well, that sounds delightful, uh, conscience. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thought you'd like it. Uh, we did our best to come up with a... with a, uh... Uh, what's the word? What's the word? A penance. A penance. <laughs> Jay, you've got to be about the most talented guy in the whole world. Ah, come on. Now I know it is your alter read. Now you really are. You hey, really what are. is this? A, a mutual admiration society? He used to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jay. You, you, you know, you could just say your name and you crack me up. Yeah, well, I don't know. People call in, they say I'm too serious. They say I'm a serious guy. I'm not that serious a guy. Well, you're complex. Jay, you're a very complex guy. You know, very complex. You're a man of many seasons. This is such a novelty. You really do sound... It, no, it sounds great. It is studio quality. It's, it's slightly different, and there's that hum, but it sounds... As the, it is uncanny, Bob. It's weird, because I keep looking here, expecting to find you, and, it's, and you're, not, you're not here, but you are a, a presence in the studio. Well, this is the way this is the way I wanted to do it anyway. I mean, I just I'm languishing here. As a matter of fact, I'm in the tub, Jay. I'm in uh, a great big Roman tub, a sunken tub. You you are you going to get out into your tunic? I don't know, wait. No, now allay my fears. This is, doesn't mean that you're going to do the show from home very often. No, not too often. Just uh, three, four times a week. <laughs> nah. <laughs> now, this is just for, for inclement weather or snowstorms or, or power failures or something, right? Oh, uh, Jay, I had no idea so much work would be involved here. Oh, here he is. Here's the fellow that Kevin just came into the control room. Hi, Kevin. Yeah, there he is. Kevin, did you hear what I said? I got two turntables at home. I get a, yeah, official business. We may have to play re music one day from my, my, from my lounge by remote control. You can handle it. No, hey, I, I don't. I don't want to interrupt your program. I don't want you to 
uh, deny your vast audience what they expect from you each and every night. I know you launch into about a 28-minute diatribe at the beginning of your program. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were waiting for it. <laughs> well, there has to be a diatribe. There's a lot of left-wing scum out there. Yes. <laughs> Vermin, I just... <laughs> <laughs> and they have to be countered. They must be countered. All right, so now this works. Does it work to your satisfaction, Kevin, while I have Bob on the line? How does it sound? The hum. Kevin says, once the hum is... And, and Bob, Kevin assures me that slight little hum will be gone Monday. Oh, really? So it'll be perfect. But it does sound good. All right. Well, that's good because Monday I will be on after the after oh, the Texas that's... Rangers defeat the New oh, York that's Inevitables. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's baseball season already. Oh, boy. Yeah, I, I looked at the schedule. The, the people, I don't know if they're going to like it. There's a couple of day games in April, Bob. Yeah, quite a few day games. They should have you go out there and do color commentary. At the stadium. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I'd like, maybe I could get a word in edgewise with Sterling. <laughs> it is hard. It is hard. It is God. <laughs> <laughs> hey, somebody tells me this year you're going to relent and you're actually going to deign to appear at the stadium. You are yes, going to go up. I'm going to go to the stadium. I'm going to go to the stadium. Uh, let's see, they have 81 home games. Uh huh. I'll be there for about 78 home games, that's all. That's it. <laughs> you know, I, 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 this is the year that I least understand baseball. They have three divisions. I don't know what teams are what. They have five layers of playoffs. I remember the glory days when it was just eight teams in, in one, eight teams, two leagues, and they played for the pennant. The pennant meant something. Now they have wild cards. You don't even really have to finish first in your division to get into the playoffs. I don't like it. Well, of course, the World Series will begin December 14th. Everybody knows yeah, right, that. Right, right, right. And uh, they'll be playing on a tundra. No, it's ridiculous. Absolutely. Hey, listen, you know why, Jay? I'll tell you why. You want to know why? Yes. I'll tell you why. <laughs> because there's so many Gavones in America whose lives are so empty. They want to fill that emptiness by being spectators at sporting events. And, and not only that, that's true. But uh, this way, if they tack on another five or six weeks to the season and a couple of more layers of playoffs, Bob, the players that are only getting $32 million on a four-year contract can now get $36 million. <laughs> <laughs> It's so ludicrous. I... <laughs> hey, wait. Madam Hillary, Madam Hillary is in charge in the White House. North Korea is building nuclear bombs. And the Middle East is in turmoil, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what was the big story for 48 hours? That the Dallas Cowboys have a new coach. That's right. That's right. A new coach. And uh, they've gone from one egomaniac to another egomaniac. I'm uh, so out of touch, Bob. I thought, I said, gee, the Cowboys had a new coach? Gosh, that's, I guess that's, the, that's it for Tom Landry. I'm five years behind. <laughs> I don't know about it. So that's all the news. I've got a great letter to read. You should listen, because I'm going to read you a letter that I got from an inmate on Rikers Island. Now, really? Let, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and and a, a beautifully crafted letter. And it's interesting. I don't think I'm going to... Give me some advice. He signs his name, but he likes the show, and uh, he agrees with my views, and that's already created some problems for him at Rikers Island, so I think maybe I should not say his name. What do you think? I don't well, think... Uh, did he request that you... No, he make... didn't. He didn't request that I... But he said that uh, there are some accusations and epithets hurled in his direction on the basis of his, his admiration for our station. Well, you know, it's an incredible thing, Jay, how many people, inmates, in various, uh, in various uh, penal institutions in the WABC listening area, do write to us. Right. As a matter of fact, I'll never forget a guy doing uh, time, heavy time, in uh, what they used to call Rawway, now it's uh, Eastern State. Uh, did you know that Rawway is no longer called Rawway? Uh, but Eastern State? No, for the yeah. last four years, I've been off their mailing list. And uh, this guy said uh, he's in there on a life sentence, but uh, he agrees with me that there should be the death penalty. Huh. He says even he should have gotten the death penalty. How does that grab Oh, that's great. I'd like yeah. to see that letter. Yeah, was that, was that a recent letter? Uh, about two, three years ago. Uh, huh. oh. But I've, uh, I've received letters from virtually every... Um, institution of that type in uh, in the area. 
uh, Danbury, uh, I received mail from... Yeah, yeah, you, wasn't there one guy who... who Who's solici- that? Who solicited you to, to go to the prison because he had some special information on some case and he turned out to be phony? Oh, that was a phony by the name of Don, uh, uh, Don Francos. Yeah. Donald Francos, who claimed he had the goods on the Svachim. Oh, right, right. I see. I remember you told that story. And I was so eager to get the goods on the Svachim, I got permission <laughs> to go up to uh, Fishkill up there. Yeah. Where he, <laughs> and I met with a guy, and he, he, he kept brandishing a, a, brief a battered briefcase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. threatening <laughs> to open it every, every two seconds. He was going to open it and reveal the contents, which would expose the Svachim. <laughs> but he, <laughs> Finally, he said, I, you told him you were coming up here. You, you broke my confidence. I'm not going to give you this stuff. I said, well, how could I, how could I get in to see you without <laughs> telling them that I was coming up here? Because I had to get permission. Yeah. So it nothing. was a fake, a phony, a fraud. And a couple of years later, he came out and he said Hoffa was buried in the end zone at Giant Stadium. So they wanted to dig up the AstroTurf to see if they could find Jimmy Hoffa. They dug it up. You know what they found? Huh? Jack Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to read my letter. Yeah, Jay, I don't want to interrupt your program. No, I'm not. I'm not. Not that you can stay. I have to take a break. If you want to stay, well, I'll sign off. Oh, you want to sign off because uh, I just have to. I can't. I, you I, can't I, I stay. Said, I'm I, so upset. I saw Connie Chung's program, Bernard Goldberg, down there at Howard University. Yeah. Um, and, and he he was such a putz that Goldberg. What a weasel! No, I don't know what happened. What was this? Well. Here's what happened. He, uh, he showed the uh, hate night at uh, Howard University where they had one incredible anti-Semitic diatribe after the next. And uh, afterward, um, Connie Chung um, asked him why, um, <clears throat> why he had said uh, that if it were uh, Jews on a, uh, uh, a different campus uh, saying uh, anti-black things the way they... Black students at Howard University were saying the anti-Jewish and anti-white things. Uh, what would have happened? And Bernard Goldberg said, well, probably nothing. And Connie Chung said, why? And instead of really telling her why, he said, well, he said, you know, they did suffer a lot. And a lot of people agree with Mr. Shabazz. What a cop. Hey, Bernie Goldberg, if you're listening, you're a twerp. I think he heard you. He did hear me. I saw, his, I saw his head lurch to the left. Well, I have a feeling that tomorrow at 3.07 p.m. sharp, maybe we'll be hearing more about this program that you saw. I have a feeling that people will hear the immortal words, let's be heard. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you tuned in, if you were unfortunate enough to tune in to Cotty Chung last night, that you saw a disgraceful spectacle, Bernard Go... Well, that will go something Oh, Jay, like. may, I, may I say hello to Carl Cush, one of my all-time favorite guys? Yes. Your, your gentleman of distinction at the controls, what a great guy. Yep. And uh, you know who else is here, Bob? Uh, William Lally. Bill Lally. Bill Lally is here. I knew Bill Lally. I knew Bill Lally when he was uh, Gene Strauss's boss. <laughs> yeah, he told me that story, yeah. yeah. He, uh, he said that she was a, a very compliant uh, oh, employee. wonderful, wonderful young woman. Sweet, demure. With a lot of suggestions for the staff. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. Not presumptuous at all. No, sweet, no, very that's, sweet. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I wish I could have been there with you fellas. Uh, Jay, it would have been complete. <laughs> it would have been complete. <laughs> Are we on? Remember, Jay, 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 Am I on? <laughs> I don't know why, Jay, but I feel so silly. Isn't that <laughs> terrible? Silly, absolutely silly. Well, maybe it's that bath. No, you know what it is? It's being with you because uh, you are such a luminary. You, uh, you, your talent is embarrassing. Uh, your dwarfs uh, any room you walk into. You dwarf it. <laughs> He's laughing at me, folks. The word dwarf. See? Say dwarf. I idolize the man, and no, he laughs at me. No, say dwarf. Let me hear you say dwarf. Dwarf. <laughs> Even that is fun. You want to see me make him laugh? I want to show you how easy. This is for all the callers at home who are intimidated by Bob. You want to, you want to disarm him? There are two things to do. These are, here are the two things. Bob's getting mad, so all you have to do is say, 
Oh, I see you're becoming very irritated with what I'm <laughs> saying, Mr. Grant. Perhaps, perhaps we could allay some of your inflammatory emotions with a nice delousing treatment. <laughs> would you please follow me into this room? You could do that, then he, it'll all, all his ire will evaporate. And then if, if I then, so then, you see, lo- <laughs> the simple reorientation of syllables in the, into a Prussian state of speech, and the man disintegrates into a little puddle, reminiscent of a small child losing control in paroxysms of laughter. You're, because of, because of your insolence, there will be no Christmas twees. The old von Scherbachs were cavalry men. Now please assist me as I put on my boots. <laughs> Wait, then there's another way. So if that, well, that will work. But if, you know, Bobby, he's laughing. Five minutes later, he could be mad at you again. But so here's, here is another <laughs> fail-safe system for disarming him in the moment, in the existential moment of Bob's irritation. So figure you're on the phone with him and you're a real gavon. You're a real boorish, unlettered slob. <laughs> and he loses patience with you. All of a sudden, so you change like this. So you see, Bob, that's what I was saying. Like I said, Bob, we got to get tough with these people and throw everybody out of the country. You know what I'm saying, Bob? <laughs> you understand? You know, I know you agree with me, Bob, because you and I think alike. I understand, Bob, that you and I are on the same wavelength. Don't worry about it, Bob. And I realize you take a lot of pride like a guy like me agrees with you, Bob. So now Bob's getting disgusted because he's listening to, you know, Bob, he's, he's got a keen aesthetic sense. And even if he, you know, if he's not inclined to dispute you, if you sound like this, Bob, you know, he's going to get irritated. So <laughs> instead of that, you say, so like I was saying, Bob, you know, I understand now. I sense you're quiet. You get the little, you lose the patience with me. Oh, I stop talking like that and I begin to talk like this. <laughs> Mr. Grant, is it not true that you asked for this equipment to be installed some six months ago? (laughs) And is it not true that there were numerous delays, none of which, of course, were due to your own insufficiency? But is it not true that at that time you misrepresented the schedule of your moving, that when you finally moved, you moved a day later... And that now, as then, you are a chronic and habitual liar! (laughs) There he goes. So that's it, folks. The man can't stay mad at you if you do those two things. It's very simple. (laughs) Well, tomorrow, if you hear his patience beginning to wane, if you hear him fidgeting, or if you can... You picture him getting irritated, if he goes, "Uh uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh-huh, okay... And if he starts to pour water, then you know to use those two voices. And he'll stop pouring the water, and he'll be laughing. Ah. Ah, I'm all worn out, Jay. All right. I'm all worn out. All right, so uh, I'll be listening tomorrow at 3.07. All right, Jay. All right? Thank you, Jay. Hey, look, thank you. It sounds good. It doesn't. Kevin says it will be letter perfect by Monday a.m. I believe Kevin. All right. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Jay. No, seriously, it was a big treat. Maybe you can do this more often now that you're at home. You've got this equipment. I don't know if I could take it, though. You have me laughing. I'm doubled up here. Oh. We'll let you do all the opens. That's the hardest part of any show. Oh. So every night you can come, you can do the open. I'm worn out, Jay. I'm worn out from laughing. <laughs> all right, I'll see you tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Bob Grant, or brags about himself or boasts, he, uh, that's really not his nature. And I just want to tell you that the times in my life when I feel like I'm a big timer, like I'm really in show business, when I, like I, I have some connection to the performing arts, is when I'm somehow sharing the stage or the microphone with a man who is the idol of millions, not just me, Bob Grant. Now, here is the letter I received, and right away I was impressed by this note, this letter, because I, I looked at the handwriting on the outside. You can't help it. People make judgments about things like that. Sometimes I get chicken scrawls, and I say, oh, this is going to be impossible to get through, but this was beautifully penned, and it was, it was, it was not cursive writing. It's, ri- it's written in block letters, so it was meticulously done. Even on the outside, my name, the station, was perfectly delineated, and then he gives his name and the number 
his number as a prisoner. He writes Rikers Island Corps, fa- you know, abbreviation for Correctional Facility, Hazen Street, and he goes so far as to say East Elmhurst, New York, which I thought was a grace note. I mean, if he, if he had just written Rikers Island, I'd know the, the uh, return address, but there was something about the formality of the person saying East Elmhurst, New York, 11370, which made me interested in this person. I was not to be disappointed. And then I opened up the letter, and I see it uh, dated perfectly. The format of the letter is perfect, and this very meticulous, very clear, uniform handwriting. Perfectly symmetrical letters. Dear Mr. Diamond, I've been an inmate confined on Rikers Island since 193, and since then I've been a loyal listener and devoted fan. That's right. I agree with you 98% of the time because what you say is simply common sense, And I believe that those who disagree with you aren't actually disagreeing with what you say, but with your having the nerve to say it. Now, this is a very smart young man. I'm going to repeat that. He says, I believe that those who disagree with you aren't actually disagreeing with what you say, but with having the nerve to say it. Now, that insight takes a lot of wisdom. I'll be 30 years old next month, and since the age of 16, I've probably spent an accumulated time span of two years out of jail. This includes a six-year stretch in the New York State prison system, mostly robberies and assaults, probably 30 arrests. I've lost count. Most of these arrests resulted from working as an enforcer for high-ranking drug dealers in Queens. I knew Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols personally and worked alongside Howard Pappy Mason on a few occasions. I'd always rationalize my behavior with the knowledge that I'd only commit crimes against other street hoodlums like myself. I've always had a fear of harassing law-abiding citizens and would even go out of my way to be kind when confronted by them. The one good thing my neighbors in residential St. Albans have to say about me is that I've never done anything to them. It wasn't until I began to consume your wisdom that I realized how disruptive my behavior has been to all of society and it is your strong condemnation of crime and hate that makes me want to be a better person. In hopes that you might have this effect on other inmates as well, I strive to recruit new listeners wherever I go, but most are simply uninterested. Then they wonder how I know so much about the growth hormones in milk, Clinton's Whitewater Gate, etc., etc. However, I have managed to convince my next cell neighbor, who is a Muslim, to tune in regularly. Although he feels your views are racist, he's captivated by your mastery of the English language and entertained by your humor. My hat's off to you on your rendition of It's a Wonderful Life, starring David Dinkins. After this individual listened for 45 intense minutes as I explained why the public has a right to be outraged by crime and how your proposals are not necessarily racist and may actually uplift the black community, he exclaimed, You're a racist too! Exclamation point. And I'm black! Exclamation point. Well, anyway, the moral of this letter is that you may not reach all of society, but if you can just reach a few, then yours is a job well done. Thank you for the enlightenment, and know that I'm listening nightly as a reminder that I do have a responsibility in making this world a better place. Keep up the good work. Your friend, and he is my friend, and I am his friend, and I won't give his name because who knows, there might be reprisals in the jernt, and I wouldn't want to compromise this, this uh, rapidly improving man. P.S., you might like to know that Philip Copeland, one of the several convicted of the murder of patrol officer, police officer Edward Byrne in Queens, is being extorted in prison. That type of thing follows an inmate from jail to jail for his entire sentence. He has life. Well, I am glad to know that, my friend, and I'll tell you, this is one of the most satisfying letters, one of the most satisfying communications altogether that I've ever received in this business or in any other business. And uh, I'm glad that you're my friend. And I'll tell you this. The one question I'd ask you if I were face-to-face with you is how some... I know the answer. Because I do believe that, that crime is an, an emotional disturbance, not an intellectual disturbance. But it's, I, when I think of a Rikers Island inmate and somebody who's been confined for, the, for uh, 12 of the 14 of the last 16 years, uh, that's better than your whole adult life, I don't think of a person who writes a letter as well-crafted and who uh, can write expository prose this carefully, I I don't think of of such an individual when I think of 
what has heretofore been a career criminal. So my feeling is that you've come to the point, Mr. X, where not only are you, are you intellectually ready to take your place in the human race, but you're emotionally ready, and that's the most important thing. And you changed on your own. I don't think I had anything to do with it, although I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm very elated that you give me some credit. But that was always within you. No matter what you were doing, there was a good spirit. I don't know how it got there, and you must have done a lot of bad things, but there was always something in you that was a beacon to the light. There was always something in you that eventually would take you on the right path, and I feel very confident that you're there now, and uh, you're my friend, and I'm your friend. Let me hear from you again. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond, and let me give the phone numbers. From New Jersey and all over, 201-489-WABC. From New York and everywhere, 212-563-WABC. And in Connecticut, and just about any locality on all points of the grid, 203-862-WABC. And right about now would be a perfect time to call in. Let's say hi to our old pal Patrick. Hello, Pat. Hello, Jay. You, let me just say it was great meeting you at, out at the Rio Diner a few weeks ago. It was uh, a thrilling event. <laughs> well, it was. you saw how thrilled I was when <laughs> yeah. you introduced yourself. Yeah. Patrick from Connecticut. I went crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, today, I don't know if you saw the Wall Street Journal or not, but I've been reading in the last few days about Singapore. Yes, I saw the editorial. Yes, and how they've been dealing with their problems. And I'm saying, these people have got it right. Because, I mean, I hear you talking about the social degeneration in our society. And you look at this country like that, it's a very small Asian nation. And they've, um, they were a dump 40 years ago, basically. They were, they were, they were um, just basically gangs out there. And they get, had self-government. And they instituted very pro-law and order reforms, and it, essentially what they've done is transformed the entire nation from a dump in, into, a, a, into a very productive, one of the most civilized societies on earth. Now, you may, they, what they do, they give the death penalty to drug dealers, they, they, in, some of their, their punishments include uh, beating people with a cane. Now, many people may, may be in horror thinking how, how excessive that is, but the fact is, it's worked. It's, I mean, it's worked. The liberals here, they're trying to think, oh, oh, that's, uh, you know, if we punish them more, they're going to do more crime. I don't think so. That's what, they're not doing it in Singapore. And they're, they've, I mean, they have a great country over there. But, Patrick, how would you describe the tone of the editorial in today's journal? I think, I mean, they were a little apprehensive about... Um, they were critical of the, of the Singapore sentence. I think... And they cited another case, a, a young, an 18-year-old girl right. who was sentenced to death for carrying some uh, some heroin into the country, she says inadvertently. Right, right. So the, well, uh, I know. They, they, the the uh, the journal uh, editorial was not gung ho for for either the caning or the hanging of this woman. Yes, but also they had one on Monday, if you recall. Yeah. And uh, who who was a, sing- a man from Singapore, who actually said that I mean most of the people there, I mean they they actually use right. a case of uh, this uh, this young American. Who everyone was outraged, uh, like at least Clinton and his uh, and his representatives, they were outraged that he would get such a stern punishment for uh, disrupting the social order. But they recommend that that he should be given executive clemency. But I mean, the mm, in the Poon right. case, in the case of the woman, they uh-huh. recommend that uh, she be given executive clemency and not hanged at the age of 18. Uh, they believe that she was a a mere mule, not aware of what she was spurting into the country. But and then they go on to say. Caning is applied to the bare buttocks. I'm reading from the editorial. Right, right, and reportedly right. leaves a bloody mess followed by permanent scars. Uh, the journal's G. Pierre Gode two weeks ago quoted a 1974 interview with Singapore's then director of prisons who said, and I'm quoting, at the end of the caning, those who receive more than three strokes will be in a state of shock. Many will collapse, but the medical officer and his team are on hand to revive them. Well... I know. I know. I mean, you may think, I think that it's somewhat also a little uh, excessive. Well, I was all for it, but I then I read this today and I began to soften a little bit. Well, you know, I mean, you have the people like your, uh, the man who just wrote to you. That, I mean, obviously you can't stereotype everyone, but you've got, to say, you've got to really get tough. I mean, you can't just say, oh, let's just look at the root causes, look how depraved they were and everything. I mean, you, you really, I mean... Uh, it's obviously worked. I mean, it seems to it seems to have worked very well there, pretty much. Yeah. Well, 
Um, maybe the compromise can be he can only get five strokes. <laughs> well, who knows? <laughs> Patrick, I, by my calendar, I see that tomorrow is April 1. Is that correct? Yes. Which tells me that in a short three months, you will be off for sunny Italy. And let me tell you, it's going to be a better Italy now that the right wingers have gained control again. Well, I was going to ask you just that question. Are you, You're looking forward, then, to going back to the, uh, the new Italy? Yes. Although I read in the New York Times op-ed uh, section today that there are grave doubts as to whether those three rightist parties will be able to work together in a coalition. Yes, because one of the parties there is essentially, they're opposed to each other. One, That's one right. of the parties is a very nationalist party, and the other party is a very separate, kind of a separatist. Uh, the Northern League. Right. The, so. uh, what's the name of the fellow from the Northern League? I can't uh, remember. Bossi? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Umberto Bossi. They, are, they want to be a separatist. They want the uh, north of Italy to secede from the rest of Italy. Right. And uh, the other two parties are adamantly against that. Mm-hmm. What, what, are you, what is your appraisal of that? Well, you think I, Italy I, I, should... I've, I've, honestly, I haven't I mean, really you, been following you, much. You go there for now. a month every year. Right. Although you, although you have as yet been unable to identify oh. the precise region that you infest. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I mean, it's not the north. So, but I mean, they're gaining a lot of support. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know people there, even there, who aren't even in the north. And they had this protest. Everyone went to this northern league as a protest. But now they have all these different protest parties. Like this uh, man who uh, actually got together uh, three months ago and formed his own party, Berlusconi, and now he's going to be, it looks like he's going to be the leader of Italy. It's really remarkable. That's right. He's like the Ross Perot of Italy, too. He's yeah. not a career politician. Kind of Reagan, also. No, he's a, he's a tycoon of business. Right. Right. All right, Patrick, uh, you're not leaving for a while, so we'll hear from you again, I trust. Yes. Thank you. All right. Good night. On WABC, this is Jade.